Welcome to the Heart of Soul podcast, an exploration of who you are, what you are, and why you are, offering new ways to investigate age-old questions at the heart of you. Hi, it's Joseph, and thanks for listening to the Heart of Soul podcast. In this episode, we begin a three-part series inside a series of unknown parts, so you do the math. The data set is three things that clog up relationality, and the first item up for bid is the idea that we create our own reality. Is it true? If you believe it, does it make it true? We examine this idea as well as revisit some Renaissance philosophy you probably forgot because your teachers and professors didn't make it meaningful for you in school, muse about what the failure of the individual will would look like on a mass scale, distinguish subtle forms of existential control from the way we relate to reality, and generally just have a good time with the wish that you'll enjoy the conversation. I remind you, as always, to please listen to this podcast from the beginning and in order. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs> Welcome forward, everybody. Welcome forward. Uh, you've joined us already in progress. Um, and uh, I'm really excited, uh, which is a, a sort of a euphemism for angry to talk about what I want to talk about today. I really feel like in the last 36 hours, the universe is supporting um, this uh, subjectivism versus objectivism. And you know, I've been thinking about, we, Stacey and I were talking just for a minute before we started recording here about like, whoa, well, because um, I'm all excited to talk about the philosophical bases of subjectivism versus ob objectivism, which we're going to get into, but then how that actually relates to relationality is the question. And I'm curious mm -hmm. where you want to start with that, but it already hits me like, well, those things are meaningless except in relationality, right? Because that's that's where we find out how objective or subjective we're being. We're negotiating our very relationship to reality in relationship with each other, aren't we? You can't divide them in one way. Yeah, exactly. They're totally right? intertwined. <laughs> so the simple way that it lives in me um, is that the whole issue of um, subjectivism and uh, versus the or subjective reality versus object reality mm -hmm. is uh, is our relationship to um, existence domain and how we relate to existence is un indivisible from how we relate to each other secondarily. Yeah, and right. That makes sense. And so and now there's a perfect example. Just that alone mm -hmm. means we are all philosophers testing our philosophy all the time. And there's no escaping it. <laughs> Back in the in the in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, my first um, attempt at uh, was on a brother's word processor and, uh, <laughs> and it was, <laughs> and it was called uh, yeah and uh, it, it, what was the title of it I still have it here just break for a moment here you still have a brother's word processor uh, wise love I have I have oh a, what you wrote on it oh, archive. I, <laughs> I mean and that was all on a on a brother's um word processor but the point is is that one of the first things i used to come out of my mouth was we're all philosophers uh for another dimension though that we're all walking value systems sure and uh and if we all have our own value systems then you have a psych a philosophical paradigm that governs what's good or bad for your value system so here you just added another uh dimension to it that um, we're all philosophers because um, how did you say it? That was great. How I you don't said know. it. <laughs> <laughs> we're all. Well, you. I don't know. That's okay. I'm in the now. Damn it. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely, you are. It was That's good right. though. Yeah, I, it, it I was. can't remember it all. Our listeners will have to write in and tell us what we say. By the way, speaking of listeners, I just want to insert because I've got I got at least three or four emails from people about the soul species stuff sending us pictures and asking me questions about it. And we got really great reviews and I just wanted to appreciate our listeners for that. Oh, thank thank you for those emails. And um, I, I hope that the uh, um, that those will keep coming. But before we go any further, we really should define objective and subjective because I don't want to leave anything to chance here. And for some people, those are very slippery subjects. Well, yeah. And in fact, objectivism 
uh, can be can be defined in a whole different yeah. number of layers. So yeah. what we mean. So let's go move forward from there. We'll start with ours, and you can critique me uh, if I if I'm not doing it so well. Uh, since uh, I learned me, metaphysics mostly from you, I doubt I'll be able to critique <laughs> you. Okay. But ninety well, percent of my metaphysical prowess I learned directly from you. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the point here is is that um, I'll, I have to put the the uh, word reality after it um, mm -hmm. to make it clearer. Subjective reality is our own take on everything. Our own take. Uh, I loved uh, back in 1951. I think uh, I don't know why I remember that, but except that it was my birth year. Uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the film, the Japanese film Rashomon, came out. Oh, re really? That was that long ago. Okay. 1951 and uh -huh. what he did was so brilliant because he showed the same um, uh, same activity uh, the same event from nine different if I remember right nine different points of view all of which were different than the other eight uh, and so there was a beautiful example of how subjective reality uh, and how it relates to objective reality, an actual event occurred, mm -hmm. which was then subjectively interpreted, of course, by all the participants. And so subjective is our own take on things and object, um, objectivism or ob the objective reality must exist if we have subjective interpretations of it. Well, that, which is with an asterisk, that's a stace philosophical, that's an Edenistic philosophical assertion. It's compelling, <laughs> but uh, I believe Nietzsche would completely disagree with that. And maybe we would get into other philosophers' takes on that idea. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's like um, uh, we couldn't have subjective, our own take on something unless there was something already there that to have a subjective take on. And I believe the uh, first Western philosopher, anyway, to assert that idea would have been Plato. That would be the theory of forms, yes, right? Yes, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So um, I, I only mentioned that in passing because some non-dualists of the Far oh, East, no. <laughs> uh, they, they hold that uh, there's no such thing as objective reality. Uh, it doesn't exist. Uh, because it's, it takes it's the subjective point of view taken to its extreme because there's no one home taking a subjective picture. So that means there's no one there's no one there's no objective reality that could ever uh, exist exist not not be known. The difference between we yeah. can't maybe we can't know objective reality in its complete in its completeness. But they argue that it doesn't exist in the first place, which is another whole really interesting topic. Uh, yeah, to I, I started to get kind of nauseated there I, because you, that's a great example of how you slash identity can make be better arguments than the people who subscribe to those paradigms <laughs> themselves. <laughs> oh. <laughs> because I've never heard anybody phrase it that way, but that in just a couple of sentences summed up the the, the non-dual paradigms point of view on why there's no objective reality. I've never heard That's a non-dual teacher explain it that well. No, no, <laughs> but I, I've had, I mean, they never did, but they, I've, I've met, heard many who hold this picture. Yeah, uh, they hold the picture, so, but they can't say that they hold the picture. No, because no. They, because they and the picture are the same. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, there's a nauseator if there ever was one. Uh, and that, that so, brings me, there's another thing here, just wanted to throw in. I'm going to be kind of animated today because I have a lot of anger <laughs> running. So just tell me to shut up if you have to. But um, uh, this phrase, because we, you hear this all the time, well, there's three realities, you know, there's person A's truth, person B's truth, and the actual truth. And you hear that, I hear that a lot, oh, it makes me crazy when, uh, or I guess probably a part of me, make a part of me crazy when people will say like, this is what I think happened and I'm passionately advocating for my take on something. Uh -huh. My subjective take on something, which mm -hmm. I'm asserting as what actually happened. Yes. No I'm doubt saying, space. Yes. No doubt space. Well, I have doubt space, uh, surely, but I'm also passionately advocating for, and I think my space, my my uh, subjective take is an objective truth. And then people will sometimes say in those moments, they'll say, well, you know, there's three truths. There's your truth or the other person's truth. And then there's the actual truth, uh -huh. which has inside it the philosophical assertion that neither person a or person b could actually know the object of truth and that's what pisses that's, me off yeah that's the intimation 
Well, what 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 is so, somehow I w- wanted to kind of hold this particular topic till later, but uh, now you've got it uh, me itching for it. Um, <laughs> what's really interesting is that the only people who could hold such an opinion that, uh, uh, as you just said, would be people who believe or have a value system of based on I think, therefore I am, or I have a mind or a brain, therefore I am. Mm-hmm. In other words, there are limits to knowing truth using the mind only, using the brain only. Yeah. So when someone says I alone create, create my own reality with objective reality, uh-huh. uh, identity would agree with them. Uh, because they would, if they're coming from their mental body only, if that's the essence of them, thought, abstractive thought and uh, abstracted opinion based only in uh, what you can see, touch, feel, hear, taste, whatever, uh, body, mind or, or, or mind eye um, are mediated, has these enormous limits. So when someone might, might, affer- uh, might um, uh, uh, say to you, or infer in such an exchange that there no, no one can know what the real objective truth is. They're right. They can't sure. if it's an I think, therefore I am based. <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, but this is why identity, which actually occurred to me this past week or so, is, is best described as a spiritual philosophy. Identity is a spiritual philosophy that has three arms to it, a psychological arm, a a non-dual arm, and a a soul-based arm. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, it's a a spiritual philosophy. So whatever philosophy we're holding here in terms of subjective and objective reality is going to be dido, distortion in, distortion out. (laughs) Um, uh, Your assumptions are going to create your conclusions perfectly. Uh, whereas the only real test or sobriety, or sobriety test of a philosophy is if your um, uh, outcome is is um, strangely um, occurs based from your assumption, but you didn't assume it would. Mm-hmm. In other words, uh, if you as- assume something about reality and then it comes out that way at the, at the outcome end, uh, and you intend your whole philosophy intended that ahead of time, or it had to logically said, well, this is what's going to happen. Here's what the outcome will be. It's an uh, it's unsober philosophy, according yeah. to identity. The outcome has to be counterintuitively. Oh, I didn't intend for that to show up, uh, and yet there it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a really interesting um, uh, way to measure the sobriety, one way to, so, uh, to measure uh, philosophies. And I'm, I'm certainly not claiming to have access to absolute truth. When I'm, when, I'm, when I'm saying I get annoyed when people say, well, there's three kinds of truths, I'm just saying it's possible for me, for my subjective point of view, to be more objective than someone else's. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. But in this yes. age of subjectivism in which we live, yes. It's yeah. like, oh, no, no, my subjective point of view, whatever it is, it's just as valid as your subjective point of view. And that's yes. what makes me crazy. Well, yes, don't you know, um, since I'm a born again Christian, my point of view is the earth is 5,000 years old and flat. Mm-hmm. And, my, and according to this kind of philosophy, it's just as valid as someone who takes them on an airplane uh, or a, a very high altitude airplane and shows them the curvature of the earth. <laughs> Uh, and so, you know, yeah, you're exactly right. Um, as soon as you relate to your own subjective reality as absolute um, or on equal par even with everyone else's, um, you're dropping out what, what, what your happens. Only a person whose opinions um, uh, determine their facts uh, would say such a thing as opposed to a rational person. Uh, facts um, are what inform our beliefs. Mm-hmm. But uh, people who, who believe uh, and then um, their their facts are based on their beliefs, of course, can never be taken seriously uh, because their beliefs are informing their choice of facts rather than their choice of facts informing their beliefs, uh, no, facts informing their beliefs. Mm-hmm. So um, this is, whole point is uh, every day we notice this in uh, human discourse <laughs> across the world, especially with Internet, which allows all of our opinions to come out as white noise all of the time. Yes. In a, in a, right. Yeah. It's so, like ever since like, you know, things like Yelp and, uh, you know, it used to be like if you wanted to watch a review, get a review from a movie, you either had to see it in the newspaper 
Yes. Which mm-hmm. I don't know if those exist anymore. <laughs> An actual <laughs> printed newspaper. <laughs> or you had to watch Siskel and Ebert, right? Siskel is yeah. dead. Yeah. Roger Ebert, yeah. I think, is it. But that was the only, like, movie review. Now you yes. can go, I don't think Netflix has reviews anymore. I think they removed it, but you, you can go to like a streaming site and you can see like 5,297 opinions about how good the movie was. Uh-huh. And, um, and of course everyone thinks that their opinion is just as valid as the next guy. Or, or yeah. Gal. Well, I, I guess, uh, I guess the only way I could agree with them that every point of view is valid is if I'm coming from the mind of God, whatever that is. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not untrue. It's it's yeah. true that they all are opinions. Right. Um, and, and, and the question becomes, what's your sober algorithm for um, valid? Uh, right. Mm. That's what we boil it down to. Mm-hmm. And what that 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 particular adjective, uh, it's just as valid. I guess that's an adjective. Uh, valid, no, yeah. not quite. Yeah. Um, what's their what's their algorithm for validity itself uh, just because you feel it or you have it uh, yeah. what's what, what's the demonstrable algorithm that makes sober your definition of validity well and then right there, there there's a big concern that i have and let me see if i can, i don't know if i've talked about it yet this podcast but what i'm concerned about we've already established the the 2013 yin era thing we've already established that, that is um making repressing emotions less possible so people have yes. to deal with all what they're feeling my, my concern is i don't remember if i've talked about this before is that it's leading to a feeling indulgence instead of mm-hmm. an emotional honoring and mm-hmm. what i because i see it uh, like on a monthly basis more and more where people because they're having a feeling about something mm-hmm. they can't step back and consider that it may be a distortion of reality that scares yes. the shit out of me. Yeah, um, the the maga morons. Uh, yeah. that's, that's their that's their stock and trade, right? Mm-hmm. And I say morons with sorrow <laughs> uh, because they're they're children of God too, but they're acting moronically. Um, and so I I think I'm valid from a a, 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 a spiritual to call them yes. morons. Remember, yeah. it was Kellyanne Conway in the Trump administration oh, yes. who coined the term alternative fact when uh, yes. defending that it was the greatest attended uh, inauguration ever when the yes. photos showed it was raining and people had umbrellas. And there were lots of empty seats. And she said, well, we have alternative facts. And I always imagine like in the Akashic records, there was sort of like on, on a lie detector <laughs> test, you know, yes. where they ask a question and then they mark on the paper where it is. <laughs> Somewhere in the Akashic, right. there, when she said alternative fact, somebody made a mark in like the Akashic record of human history of like, uh oh, we're heading into something now. Well, you're you're right to be um, uh, aggravated, upset, and dreading um, yeah. such a development because you're. I love the way, your way you put that. I didn't use words like that before about feeling indulgence. Mm-hmm. Um, I spoke. I speak directly in it for years and years. How um, the difference between feelings and emotive reality. Yeah. Uh, our whole paradigm is based in on the personal is based in that that you can't trust feelings. But we have, there's no other word. I Believe me, I've, I've looked all over in every thesaurus <laughs> possible. Is there another word beside feeling that captures it? And it doesn't. We can feel a distortion just as much as we use the word feeling um, a truth. So there's no yeah. adjudication in using the word feeling. And, and it's the same with open- thoughts, of course. Yes, exactly. But, but you're right that it's led to a, a yin feeling um, uh, um, proponency of opinions uh, now, in addition to the one we already too much have, and that's mental body philosophical absolutism. Now we've got feeling-based absolutism. Yeah, cause because I swear like 15, 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago, I don't remember remember, remember anyone saying, but it feels true to me. And now yeah. I feel like I hear it every month where I'm challenging someone's beliefs or someone's reality. I'm like, no, no, this is what happened. And they're like, yeah, but that's not how it feels. And I'm like, are you insane? Here yeah. are the facts. <laughs> well, and then we have uh, this hashtag facts, not feelings, which is throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Because, of course, yeah. identity is the only paradigm I know that actually makes a distinction between an emotive truth and a passing yeah. mood and feelings. But the, right. without that distinction, it's not looking good for the, for no, the species. It, it's- no, it it uh, it leaves all the doors open for uh, open tribalism degenerating into open um, uh, uh, anarchy. 
right? And, and it's crazy making because the this extra honoring of feelings is necessary. Right. But then there has to be a secondary, okay, this feels true to me, but why might it feel true to me? Because that could be a projection. It could be a trigger. It doesn't necessarily mean that feeling is a reality or it could be a little bit of both. So we're in this place in society where people are honoring their feelings and that's great, but they don't have the tools or proclivity or interest in sorting out what part of that might be a distortion while honoring all those feelings. It's still all yes. It's yes, yes that's, that's the feeling. Yes, that's your subjective take on reality. And yes, half of that is a mother projection. Yes, Not, exactly. No, no, that. that's no. There's no no in that. It's all yes. <laughs> it's crazy making when, when you uh, um, are able to feel all the dimensions of that. But again, there's a deeper context for the um, exactly the conundrum that uh, you're, you're, just, you're speaking to or the dilemma. Mm -hmm. And that is that... Um, we people act as if the only thing that's real and substantive is that which we're conscious of. Oh, when when as far right. back as Freud and Jung and Adler, they all created modern psychology based on the fact that the unconscious rules the conscious until the conscious gets uh, realizes how much the unconscious rules the conscious right so when someone's like but it feels th that this yeah. is true they're not they're they're not saying they're not asking the question but why does it feel that way and is it possible that that's coming from my unconscious distortion not conscious Exa you know, exactly exactly curiosity and that and that that is the arbiter for me um why i can't take seriously even though my life may depend on it uh, one day. I can't take seriously these kinds of uh, uh, debates because uh, wait, you're not you you're, you're disallowing one. Ab you're you're promoting absolutism, which is impossible to any human being, especially me, because I talk about reality a lot and talk about truths a lot, and I don't even hold myself as a as a as a purveyor of absolutism. It's just here it is. Let's let's keep talking. Well, here's what it's offered. When you when all these debates are based on the fact that the person is denying a 150 year old truth that's been around the planet a thousand million times since nine, in the 19, early 1900s that our unconscious is running us we're not we're yeah. not running which us. and then uh, you know never mind psychology which is easy for people who uh, you know haven't learned much about it to, to discount but I just go to marketing like if it mm -hmm. didn't work then marketers wouldn't be putting billions of dollars into and making billions of dollars by appealing to people's unconsciousness because that's absolutely what they're doing on sure. purpose, like carefully, like yes. that's what they're doing. And, and that's, yeah, well, that's right. And that's why that it's so bankrupt to say, to, to base economy, uh, economic issues on, well, people will act in their self-interest. Uh, which, yeah, which, self, only. <laughs> which, which self interest are we talking uh, about right you see uh did he, and again let's reiterate because it's a perfect moment for it that identity holds a two-thirds of of um of our of our being is is unconscious to us and only one third of our unconscious uh, 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 only one third of our our consciousness is conscious so that and, and that two two thirds is emo, emotively wounded, which means it warps and distorts everything. That's everyone by default, unless they can claim they had perfect parenting, where a per parent, both parents felt them, felt what they were feeling, what they were feeling, why they were feeling it, and while they were feeling it, one hundred percent of the time of their childhood. Now, if someone can claim and substantiate that claim, I'll retire identity. <laughs> um, <laughs> because that's the only the only uh, dynamic that would allow to, for people to not have unconscious wounding. And so to have no curiosity about the sobriety or validity of their opinion shows they're either young souls or they lack critical thinking. Um, it's one of the two. And so is, do, do more people, uh, um, are, are there more young souls on this planet and more souls that don't have critical thinking that do? Yep. <laughs> That's a fact in this world. We're the, we're the we're, uh, odd ones out here. You've got scientific empiricists 
who will say they, they have critical thinking, but they don't doubt their, their scientific uh, worldview when they are atheists. So uh, uh, again, um, uh, empiricism is the religion or the god of atheists, right? Uh, scientific atheists anyway. So they don't have doubt space there, so they can't claim they have critical thinking. What we mean by critical thinking is that you have doubt space about everything you think is true or feel is true. Without that, it's a madhouse. And this is why Joseph, my beloved um, uh, colleague here, <laughs> has got so much righteous aggravation running uh, <laughs> because it's just a circus out there. I know. Um, but especially in the adding feeling now, which is an unavoidable middle ground to getting to emotive reality. Because the lack of critical thinking was already in decline. And then yes. it seems like there's this other spoke of the wheel now where yeah. it's like, well, I feel this to be true. And it's like, uh, and like that, that's, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. And yeah. um, it's, you, you know, it's 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 almost as, it's as if like, Sometimes I'll be like, has there ever been something, I'll ask people, have there ever been something you were really sure about that you discovered wasn't true, like anywhere in your life? Like, how do you get to age 30 without that happening? Right. And then like right. they get that and then it's like, okay, but now I know everything. Now I've got everything figured <laughs> out. And it reminds me of like, just even in, in dreams, like every, literally every night, every night, we believe a set of stories and experiences and then we wake up and realize that none of it actually happened. Every yeah. day that happens. <laughs> Every day. And then we wake up and are like, no, but I am a master of reality. I know what's going on. You spent all night completely deluded. <laughs> now, 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 spoken with true passion and authenticity by a very self-aware individual. And since the majority of people on the planet, bless their children of God hearts, are not self-aware even in a modicum uh, uh, manner of speaking. So uh, self-awareness is the other dimension to this, which is lacking in our world. And, and it hinges on a bunch of different domains, why we're so un unself-aware of ourselves. So um, but let's, well, let's go to the bones though, uh, Joseph, and let's recast this whole thing inside of uh, now, how does it affect, how is it linked between our relationship with um, experience uh, objective reality uh, you, you, and, and in, with each in, other in relationality you want to really you want to go there before we because uh, i still want i'm still itchy to talk about the renaissance philosophy history as background uh, no to... i i'm going to open the door to that with this okay. first element all right there's three elements right okay and and so and here's the first one that ties together the, both the relationship with reality and the relationship with each other oh, okay. the statement the statement is that um i i create my own reality ah. okay that, that statement is actually um, accurate, uh, that we all create our own reality based on our subjective conditioning, okay? Whatever that conditioning is, right? And so that's true if you look at it that way. But most people hold it uh, that I create my own reality parenthetically and unconsciously, and I don't need, and, and there's no one else that will affect my um, uh, creating my own reality but me. This is the underbelly uh, that's uh -huh. intimated in that, which drives me crazy just as much as what you decide drives you crazy is that I, I to, to actually believe in your heart of hearts that you alone create your own reality and there's no one else in the world uh, that would ever affect your own take on reality would mean you'd have to live on a planet with no other people. Uh, <laughs> This is absolutely absurd. It's quite an assertion now, of self-authority. Oh, my. It's megalomaniac, narcissistic yeah. delusion, right? Yeah. Uh, there are seven and a half other uh, seven and a half billion other people who would not would not have the same take uh, as you do uh, about you creating your own reality. Maybe there's a lot that would uh, appeal, uh, agree with you. But uh, that statement has only if from according to just what identity's opinion is that statement i i only it is only i who create my own reality has truth only in one skinny domain and that's that related to i, I remember i read that line from uh devil wears prada where where Reynolds oh. streep has oh, that yeah. brilliant thing like oh you think you chose that sweater out of some right. department right. store but you don't know that that came from this and that came from this and this designer and this movement and actually started like 30 years ago 
right. and get weak. And I see this all the time with people and their beliefs and values. You know, when they say, just let it go. And I want to say, do you know where that idea came from and how many <laughs> twists and turns and distortions it's been through before you think you're creating your own reality by letting it go? That idea is 2,500 years old. And yes. You, and you didn't really choose it um, at all in some ways. And that's why I, I chuckle when people actually think that memes were invented only secondarily to the Internet, uh, <laughs> where, where there have been cultural memes like that sure. uh, a, a per, uh, as part of our global intercourse for thousands and thousands of years. And yet you think um, uh, it's just invented or you invented it. Yeah. I mean, so it's crazy making. But the point here is, is that um, if someone said, I I create, I only create my own version of reality. Now, if that's what they mean by I alone create my reality, I, I, I shake them, I get, shake their hands and have a, uh, an espresso with them. But um, that, because that, ver I, oh, I alone create my own version of reality has doubt space in it. Well, it's just my version. Yours might be truer than mine. M mine might be truer than yours. We'll have to talk it out and see if we can find some common ground. There's dialogue um, possible there instead of demagogue. Um, and this is where, and, and the part of the distortion of this idea, I mean, it goes all the way back to uh, Marshall McLuhan's, I think it was him. No, he, he said medium is the message. But he may yes. have also been the pro progenitor of um, perception as reality, which yes. was from... Yeah from Buddhism into yes. modern marketing. Yes, but exactly the Buddha, right. Correct me if I'm wrong, Buddha didn't t teach that the world was illusion. He taught no. that your world was an illusion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he was a little ahead of his time, we could say. Yeah. Um, uh, but but it reminds me also of uh, how you reminded me earlier uh, today about um, uh, Kierkegaard's, where he defines sub subjectivity as truth, and truth is subjectivity. Um, it's that is implying that there are limits to all sub all truths because all truths are held uh, subjectively. And in fact, clean science, I have to <laughs> now I'm 71 years old. I didn't used to have to say clean science because <laughs> science out there um, at the moment uh, is so lost. It's doubt space. Real science is fail, fail again fail better, just like mm -hmm. that Buddhist teacher teaches, right? Um, well, everything is up for grabs because who knows when the next data set is going to replace your current data set. That's clean science. That is not science. It was never As an it, ideology. It was, it was, uh, science was never it, an ideology. It was a process of discovery, and now it's become Yeah, I mean, wow. I mean, come on. So the idea here is that to link this to where you want to go, uh, I alone create my own reality. Um, now that now, how does that affect that? That affects relationality because if you really believe you you're the only one that creates your own reality, not just your version. Uh -huh. You can you just create space to be a victim of other people's uh, distorted of other interpretations of reality, right? Because Exa exactly because it's always going right. to feel competitive with with you on it that's brilliant it, uh -huh. it leaves room for victimhood mm -hmm. whereas i i i create i only create my version of reality so if an authority abuses me um let's say let's, let's say let's say an authority abuses me um uh i'm a victim because my point of view is sacrosanct i don't have any distortions in my point of view here's well no here's what i experienced he he or she said this to me which shamed me yeah, uh, I didn't do anything of, to deserve this. I didn't. Right. I don't have anything in my unconscious wounding that would have drawn this, so I could learn from it. I have no yeah. contribution. This thing happened to me. Yes, mm -hmm. that's another um, so, uh, hidden side effect of I create. I alone create my own reality, not my own version of reality. You see, wow, that's so wow. So that that is the hidden dynamic inside of all victimhood is that only my take on reality is the reality this is nuts i mean this is crazy making uh but again to repeat before we move on inside of a picture that just if they mean i alone create my own version of reality uh i would we identity would agree with it uh the idea, though, is that uh, w uh, when you now relate that truth, which has 
dimensions into relationality with others and your relationality to objective reality, there becomes the conundrum. Oh, right? Wait, I got to insert something here. Wow. This is not a small thing. I've never heard you talk about this before, the, this this room for victimhood, because the the um, I create my reality um, is an expression of control. Yes. Yes. And so there's this a priori assumption of like, I am in control or I should be in control. Uh, and so anything that comes at me that upsets that control, that's bad, that's happening to me. And it just, just this morning, I, I, I was talking to my, my lady and um, about some elect, electronic stuff going on. Just, just woke up at 7 a.m. My and the batteries were too low in my house and the generator wasn't working and I had to troubleshoot it. It was an intense thing and it was a I, it was yet again one of these situations where i had to for some reason be smarter than the professional electrical contractors i've hired to do shit someone <laughs> put in a a, 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 a a a circuit breaker that was had tripped somewhere that was not sufficient for the possible total load something um would have going oh, across i get it yeah yeah and, I get it. and it was like and so i was talking to one of them and the guy who put in the 30 amp um uh, circuit breaker and uh, I was like, yeah, because I talked to someone else, the guy who sold me the generator, and he says like, yeah, yeah, he told me to ask why would this trip, is it old or is it not enough? And he's like, well, let's do the math. And and it came up that, I was like, well, this generator usually pulls around 7,000 watts. And so like, yeah, that's right up at 30 amps. It's right on the line, right? And he's like, yeah, it is. Like, I'm like, I'm covering my mouth like, you're the guy who put the, the thing in. Like, this should be 60 amps, right? Right, and, exactly. And, like, and I'm like, why am I having to be the one figuring this out? Right. But that's a subjective as a thing, too. But anyway, I was saying like, oh, okay, we can just swap this thing out for like a 50 or a 60 amp um, uh, circuit breaker. And and my lady said, yeah, you 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 have one of those. We, we were messing around with them the other day when we were trying to fix the washing machine, right? And I was like, what are you talking about? The washing machine doesn't have circuit breakers inside of like, but, but I had enough doubt space that mm -hmm. I didn't just automatically dismiss her reality. Mm -hmm. I like tried to take it on and I, I was like, are you sure? What are you talking about? And I'm, I'm trying to picture us working on that put in my memory. Cause I don't trust my memory anymore, which gives me a lot mm -hmm. of doubt space because it's mm -hmm. gotten so bad. And then um, and then I started to feel like a, a rising tide of insanity in me that is a direct result of the erosion of control that I've been working yeah. on. Uh -huh. And so this is, you know, kind of thing happens all the time. Two people remember two things differently, but I, I don't think I've ever felt that insanity rise. And uh -huh. that relates directly to this control thing. Uh, because when yeah. people lose this sense of control that is totally illusory, I right. think that's what's universally underneath it is this insane, like, oh, my God, I don't have a grip on reality thing. And yeah. so I started to feel that insanity. And she's like, look, they're right over here. And then she showed me a bunch of these tiny little three amp fuses. She was confusing yeah. circuit breakers, which are, you know, these big chunky size of yes. fist things and yeah. fuses. And I was like, oh, thank God. Because now but, you had a common language. Now you had a common language. Exactly. Right? But but what seemed really important there was to actually feel the insanity of um, that's underneath the loss of that control, and and that's why I think we, um, because if if you start really, how do I say this? If if we're really immediate and um, honest and and present with the negotiating of reality with other people, which requires curiosity, which absolutely requires curiosity, <laughs> but it also requires the willingness to experience cognitive dissonance, feeling crazy, yes. feeling right. misunderstood, right. disoriented, it, just right. about something as simple as like, do we have this object or not? This wasn't like about our relationship or who said what or anything. It was about whether we had this object in the house. And that's how quickly that insanity can, can arise. It was really fascinating. Oh, again, thanks for bringing the personal rubber to the personal yeah. road here. Um, but it's, it also um, illuminates a larger uh, uh, systemic problem in our world, which is at, at cause for so much divisivity, uh, divisivity and chaos at the moment, yeah. is that it's a, like a positive feedback loop. We're already over bombarded with things that make us feel uncomfortable, unsure, create anxiety, um, all these things. And then if you get a pinpoint, here's what's happening in my personal world in this personal moment that makes me uncomfortable, 
I, I can't handle it. I can't emotionally digest it because I'm doing that every day in the background. If I, yeah. if, unless I don't look at any news or look at any social media or don't look at any yeah. internet, yeah. right, or any TV. Yeah. So um, th that makes the whole thing grind even more without uh, lubricating oil until one day the whole machinery is going to freeze up. Um, mm -hmm. And that's that's a day when finally there will be enough of will. So, and the will will for power driving our worlds, gears will finally gum up and stop for a moment. And only when that happens, I don't know what the sequela would be on the external world, but only then can, uh, instead of will to power, is surrender to, um, uh, uh, re to, surrender so wait, to unfoldment. Are you saying, are you <laughs> saying that the... Uh, because I think about this often, especially when I'm aggravated by the what I call extreme subjectivity or sort of arbitrary subjectivity. Are you saying that the dead ending of everyone's reality being the reality, which is what people are doing, mm -hmm. is going to be a cognitive dissonance that shuts that like shuts down will like gears unmeshing and will just somehow create some like pandemic event of cognitive dissonance that will shock people out of their will-based uh, solipsistic narcissistic realities oh i love when <laughs> someone uses solipsistic in a sentence oh man i, I get all itchy uh on that one yes the the and, and that's what i'm positing uh now what form or expression that will take i have no clue but um, the only one I can think of, we used to make jokes about it, right? How are we ever going to have peace in the world? I, well, not until a UFO hovers over the White House, you know, and uh, yeah. maybe we'll remember we're all human being earthlings, you know, in our terror of what's yeah. going to happen next. Uh -huh. But this is deeper than that. That's 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 a different kind of dissonance. This is an internal reality distortive index. It's indexed with reality distortion. So, uh only when there's a failure of will to power, which is in this case, the power of my own control and sanity, only when that is no longer able to sustain the overload of dissonance will divinity have room oh, okay. to pass over to the next. Does that make sense? Yeah, I didn't think of it that way. So you're saying be because, and it's, it's uh-huh, so because ev people's individual wills are the, it's the fuel source that is able to sort of manage and cope with and pave over all of the dissonant realities. Because as souls, we experience reality as is in a whole way. And yes. then it gets chopped up into pieces and distorted by the mind, which is downstream of will, as the mind is enslaved by will. Yes. As and that's a shit ton of work. Yes. To, um, which, eventually, to that. which yeah. eventually will get overloaded and people will be unable to do that. And, and, yes. and then yes. there'll have to be some kind of critical mass of people's wills failing. And then yes. the, the flood of the actual true reality that they've been holding back will just overtake them. I mean, yes. that would be almost like a Satori like experience, wouldn't it? It, it would. And yet um, it, there has to be some sort of and I know this term is used uh, uh, in COVID uh, uh, um, apo uh, 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 apologists, a uh, mass conversion. Um, <laughs> there's a there would have to be a, a, a critical mass conversion of some kind for that to undermine our current um uh, um, driving driving our 787 of our humanity directly down into the ground, uh, which all of this will to power. That's why it's so important. That it's the will to power that we use from our wounds that doesn't allow us to digest uh, discomfort with our, um, our, our lives. Uh, we can't digest it. So the, again, if 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 the if the algorithm for sobriety or the benchmark for sobriety if for any paradigm is that it 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 explains more and more clearly and brings up more unknown to known uh, answers to the same questions the previous paradigm held we could say that the next paradigm um, is better suited uh, to guide us on our next journey as an individual or a species. So until you know, until uh, heliocentricity or until um, uh, terracentricity, 
uh, finally uh, hit its dead end with scientific revolution and, and heliocentricity was the was the thing. Heliocentricity explained the movements in the heavens better, it explained uh, diurnal effects uh, 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 better, so it replaced uh, terracentricity. Same principle here. Uh, I would offer, I, I'm, I'm wondering positively, if identity itself is somehow intricately tied to everything we just said, because mm -hmm. it is a paradigm that explains everything more clearly, un, un, unblocks con, uh, uh, um, um, what, what is uh, uh, confrontation, not confrontation, um, con not controversy, working with a con no, <laughs> it, it explains um, things that don't go to go with each other. Uh, Incoherence? No. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> that explains. Contrails? Contradictions. Contradictions. <laughs> Convents. It explains, identity explains contradictions uh -huh. uh, way more fulsomely. Yeah. Um, and all, it's all based on we feel, therefore we are, not mm. I think, therefore I am, or even I will therefore I am. And I, uh, back to our central track here, uh, I, uh, the I, oh, I alone create my own reality is, is wound will based. It's wound will based. And so of course it's wound based if you mean it, uh, not, not just that you have doubt space about it, but it, I create my own reality and, I, and I'm not going to be curious or have doubt space about my own reality. That's what that usually means out there in meme world yeah. Yeah. Um, so the bottom line here is one of the things that impedes both our relationship with existence which we'll get back to now uh, and um, our relationship with people and others is this distorted wound-based ideas that i alone create my own reality therefore everyone else is real and i don't have any doubt space about it um, and that's what creates most of the mayhem uh, to our heart, our heart of soul in this world. So um, as you um, as we wanted to talk to, that's just one of three things that that screws our ability to do personal relationality. Uh, that's just the first term. We've got two more to go. But let's let's um, side wow. let's side down the rabbit hole of objectivism versus subjectivism. Yeah. Um, and this is a favorite of Joseph's uh, listeners. Uh, <laughs> Because um, what he does is meta track um, philosophical sobriety in a way that's so incisive um, that um, it, it so resonates with mine. But I wouldn't think to um, uh, be in, in, as incisive about it as he is. So the idea here is um, about whether or not objective reality really exists or is ever knowable. And we've already kind of beaten to death all the distortions in the subjectivity, the excess now feeling based subjectivity that's justifying uh, no curiosity space about our own opinions right mm -hmm. so um what we have now uh, all the since as the renaissance uh, move forward um we've all, all philosophy now is based on i think therefore i am or i have a body brain therefore i am it's not based on anything else to have it based on anything else, you'd have to go to mystical philosophy. And that's that spiritual philosophy is um, not taken seriously by mainstream philosophy because mainstream philosophy is based on I think, therefore I am. And for example, Buddhist philosophy is based on uh, I think, therefore I am an illusion. Uh, so it's diametrically opposed if they really melted down what that what their paradigm is based on. Uh, if you delude yourself that thinking makes you a self, um, uh, uh, then you are unenlightened, you see. So, but they would, they could say they support, I think, therefore I am, as the, as the, from the other side, as the proof of the illusion. And that's what a lot of them do now, nowadays. So wait, that's why they agree. For a second. How, uh, yeah. Oh, wait, how? How does I think, therefore I am result in the proof of illusion? Um, because their point of view is the self the illusory self is held together by thoughts images oh. uh, <laughs> emotions all right. that oh, stuff who is it See? i think it was uh ramana maharshi the thinker is the thought yes mm -hmm. right and that's the that's the linchpin of the of the illusion right um so in that sense um uh 
even Buddhist psychology, uh, Buddhist philosophy is based on, in a weird way, I think, therefore I am, but for the opposite reason. So it's really an interesting uh, uh, I want to insert here into the record. I can't remember if I talked about this before. God mm -hmm. knows I can't remember what I ate for breakfast yesterday. Um, but uh, in the podcast, that, that to me what's really important it's, so it seems anyway, to help people understand just how subjectivistic an era we live in is to realize that this pendulum swing, this um, the, the post-truth era, which is the, yes. a way mm -hmm. of describing the extreme subjectivism, the, the alternative fact era, the my opinion, my feeling is just as valid as anyone else's, no matter, even though I've only been thinking about this for a minute and this other person over here has been dedicated their life to thinking about it, you know, but mine's just as valid. Where all this started was a rebellion against the object of reality that was oppressively shoved down people's throats by the Catholic Church. Uh, yes. And it was the where this all started to change was the invention of the printing press in early 16th century. And right. then uh, Rene Descartes, I think, was born um, in the 1590s 15. or something. Yes, uh -huh. 15, late 15. What I found fascinating when I did a bunch of research on this is I wanted to see if I could chart like, how did we get into the subjectivistic mess? Because Descartes started, well, first there was the, everyone gets to interpret the Bible the way they wanted, which was a good thing in many ways. But the problem is this rebellion against the church. It was objective reality is bad because we're getting oppressed with it. We're going to make up our own minds. And to me, that feels like it was like a pebble thrown in a pond that continues to ripple today. And if we just understood the rebellious emotional motive of that, yes, then right. maybe we could come back more toward the middle without having to have the gears of will freeze up on us and potentially well, cause quite a lot of destruction. Well, let, and that was really well said there, very clear. Um, and let's look at it another way here is... Um, I heard that was very clear, but it's not enough to save the world. <laughs> <laughs> not at the moment. But let's go down to the bones. Okay. What we resist persists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So our current area, our current arena of post-truth, um, uh, um, post... Uh, um, you used a couple of different posts there that were great. Uh, our current era was invented, only got room with an I think, therefore I am a point of view, which was in resistance to the mystical objective reality as defined by, excuse me, I'm saying this on purpose, I'm not mispronouncing, mis, uh, Catholicism. Catholics. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, that they have been well. That, don't get me going on that one out of the compassion for human beings, but um, and on the damage it's done. But the, you're exactly right. But in the resistance of it, let's go meta, meta, meta. And I think, therefore, I am got us out of the mystical dark ages, for God's sake, and got us all the way into the uh, Renaissance of arts and science. And it was and also the creation of a work ethic. Exactly. Uh, work ethic, like uh, social right. mobility, which didn't exist under that extreme objectivism. Right. And so the Catholic Church's take on objective reality based in original sin uh, and, and an angry God, not a loving God. Yeah, that original um, sin is very objective. Everyone's got very it. Very objective. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got it. Um, unavoidable, uh, even though you didn't do anything to earn it except be born. Right. Well, that can't get started on that. But the point here I want to make in the meta, meta, meta is that thankfully the Renaissance and uh, as you have here, you know, Hobbes and Locke and Kant and Sir Kierkegaard and, the, and Nietzsche, they all came, not Nietzsche so much, but they all came forward with and I think therefore I am rational basis for human consciousness. Um, and that should have been the end of the Catholic um, uh, uh, point of view. Right. But yeah didn't it yeah. wasn't uh -huh. it wasn't right now that should have died then but it still persists with over well about between three and five billion out of the seven and a half billion oh so there's uh, still some something sort of, to resist mm -hmm. there's still something to resist you see mm -hmm. so in the keeping the resistance it it persists with its own if there was got if it's distortion in there's distortion out mm -hmm. it was against something not created out of nothing. And so there's going to be dynamical bandwidths in it that's going to be just as distorted as oh, Catholicism. Oh, wow. I had not lost. 
I've studied this a lot. That never occurred to me. That's the same way um, the Biden administration was built all around. Well, anything Trump did, we're doing the opposite now. And, yes. which, and, and Trump became the fuel for the left's insanity. Because right. yes. because right. if, if Trump did it, it must be wrong, even though he did yeah. some things right and well. But no, that must be rejected, too. So yeah. the same way, um, you know, atheists have to reject God because that was shoved down their throat. So there can be no God and there can yeah. be no this. And no one can tell me what to do. And all boundaries are bad. And I think therefore I am. And there's no objective reality. It's, right. it's the baby with the bathwater thing. A absolutely. So as as we thank we thank all the Renaissance and uh, and Reformation folks and their phil philosophical points of view because it got us out of the Dark Ages. But identity says we live now in the Dim Age, not the Dark Age. Mm -hmm. The Dim Age. If I think, therefore I am. And just how um, Catholic or mystical philosophy should have died back in the early 1500s. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, therefore, I am, uh, died uh, in 2012. And so, um, but it's, it's going to persist for a while. Uh, identity is was uh, ahead of the curve because way before we knew that 2012 was going to bring in divine yin, emotive-based calibration of the human consciousness, before we knew that, I was hawking, we are emotional beings before we're willful beings, mental beings, and physical beings, uh, and energetic beings, way 25, 30 years before 2012. So it just happened that the 2012 thing happened to underline or, or co-sign what identity was trying to say for a while. But we're not trying to resist, I think, therefore I am, or I have a will, therefore I am. We're simply offering an alternative. It's not against anything. It really is a new thing, a new offering to consider, because both Catholicism, <laughs> Uh, how uh, uh, mystical philosophy was replaced, was should have been replaced by um, uh, a rational and empirical philosophy. We're not trying to replace anything. Um, we're simply saying because both of those systems were based on absolute truth. All of the atheism, all of the non mysticality, and and I think therefore I am, or I'm, I have a brain, therefore I am, um, is uh, is held absolutely. There's no there's there's not real science behind it because so it's no uh, it's, different than it's, it, it's trying to replace one absolute truth with another. Exactly. The mm. only solution to this whole conundrum is a philosophy whose founder and its metaphysical principles absolutely reject absolutism. Because absolutism <laughs> is the background glue. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, what, what are those things? That Maybe only... not even absolutely. I don't know. Because <laughs> uh, you have to entertain a universal truth that could be absolutely I, true. Yeah. Well, um, well that's what, exactly how we cast it. Thank yeah. you. We yeah. hold, we hold um, that we feel before we um, will uh, think, uh, have a body, or are made of energy. Um, that's that is held as a universal truth to be tested mm -hmm. every day with curiosity, not taken absolutely. So here's the difference in, between a universal truth and an absolute truth. Universal truth does not demand absolutism. It's offered in integrity with curiosity in what clean science should be. Let's play with this as a new data set and see if it unfolds anything we couldn't see through the lens of the prior um, paradigm, right? So um, this is why this whole question of objective reality and subjective reality comes up so deeply, even though this might be kind of dense for some of the po podcast listeners at the moment, over philosophical or over heady. Um, what we what we want to do, though, is use the mind that we do have um, to expose the limits of the mind. Well, here's a non-mind thing for a moment. Um, when you were talking about uh, and sort of revealing to me the obvious, which is that the rebellion against the oppressive objective truth of uh, the Catholic Church didn't make the church go away, I felt yeah. a very deep sorrow about that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't exactly know why, but just like you said, it, it the Protestant Reformation should have displaced... Yes these yes. oppressive objective powers, but it, it didn't. It weakened the church a lot, but it, it, did. it never it destroyed did. it. And no. there's something profoundly sad about how just how slowly the wheels move in this world. 
and how slowly human evolution, uh, 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 a, a mental philosophical evolution, how slow it moves. It's yeah. so painfully slow. And yeah. that's just a really difficult thing to grapple with. So let's sum that piece up. Uh, that what the reason why I think therefore I am, or I have a body, therefore I am, has its limits is because it was um, in resistance to and held mm. the, the, the germ, the thing that it, that, it, that it took along with it as a result of being in resistance is it's absolute, just like uh, the church's is absolute. Related to that brief rabbit hole, I've asked you this before, but I can't remember. What are the metaphysics behind what we resist persist? Why is that? Why, why, is it, why has it become true? Yeah. Uh, because uh, when we're in resistance, we we, lo we're, we lose curiosity. It's really simple. Uh, it, if you're all the way into resistance, you've lost your doubt space. You're dedicated. You're you're activizing. You're you're on it, right? Um, especially if you get vehement about it, right? Mm -hmm. So um, resistance-based uh, vehemence. Uh, is implying that you have an absolute take on reality. And that's why, because that is a quote unquote, big quotes here, is a sin against reality if you think you have an absolute take on things because that's just delusion. No human being, no human being, even when Pope, whatever number they are these days, when, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, they teach when he says, I am going to speak ex cathedra, he has got the mouth of God and cannot make a mistake. Did you know that about the Catholic Church? I, I, I knew that he was supposed to be infallible, but I didn't know that was like one of the sequelae of that. Or no, no, he, that. he he had to say it up front. I am now speaking ex cathedra. Oh, like, like a magical incantation. Yes, exactly. <laughs> He's channeling. Uh, well, yeah, he's channeling the mouth of God through his human mouth, right? Hey, if Muhammad so, can speak the absolute word of God, then why can't the Pope? I mean, it's only well, fair. Well, you know, let's, let's be fair in the same <laughs> distortive domain, sure. Uh, every, let's distort uh, that one, too. Oh. So, yeah, you're exactly right here. And so, uh, in that sense, the glue that holds everything we're saying so far in this relationality um, set of um, podcasts is absolutism is uh, has no referent in the human condition relative to consciousness? Is it an absolute? Is it an absolute fact that a piano falling on my head from the third story of a hotel as I'm walking by during lunch hour in New York? Uh, since the physics don't allow two um, uh, masses to share the same space at the same time, uh, it is an absolute fact that uh, um, objective reality exists because a piano falling on my head, I can't look at it and go, oh, this is all a projection of my mind. Um, now you're going to die. You're going to be turned into a pancake. So there are absolute facts. When we say that, though, they're demonstrable by observable and measurable effects. But even in physics, they would say there is a somehow I, I never I, I learned a little of these physics, never not enough to explain it. But apparently there's some way to calculate the probability of all of the molecules inside that piano being just so, so that it goes right through you and you're fine. It's a <laughs> well, slim that, chance, but it can happen. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and they will acknowledge it's a slim chance, but um, especially when we start getting down to quantum, quantum yeah, mechanics. Yeah, right, right. Um, uh, the equations in mathematical language don't always have a real world correlate. That's right, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, look at, look at the concept of infinity. Infinity uh, had a beginning. Let's talk about mathematical. Yeah. But it doesn't have an end. Yeah. In other words, it starts with one, but you could keep counting for yeah. infinity. It has no end to it. So something that every, every, the normal philosophy, common sense says, <coughs> if it has a beginning, it has an end. Yeah. Well, no, mathematics proves that isn't true, um, but yeah. is is that, is that a real truth or is that yeah. just a function of its own? And then own there's that, that paradox of, uh, is it Mino's paradox? If you walk towards something and you go half the distance and then you go at half that distance, you, sure. go, you keep going, sure. half, you never reach it. Right. The mathematics will turn out every time with Zeno's paradox. Zeno's and paradox. every time they will predict you cannot get to the fence That's or right. wherever you're walking to. Yeah. So just because it may be mathematically uh, demonstrable, there is space for a piano and I to share the same... <laughs> 
um, uh, uh, loci yeah. of existence um, doesn't make it true. So um, it's again, just like when people tell me that when we roll out their simulation philosophy and they say, you know, this is all simulation. Elon Musk thinks so. And, mm -hmm. and it's like, it's just all a game. And I'm like, cool. Well, if it's all a game, give me all of your money because it's just a game. It doesn't matter. Right. And then they go, oh, uh, 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 oh, you don't want to? I guess it's a little more serious than a game, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yes, yes. Oh, excellent. They okay, don't actually so... relate to life that way, but they... <laughs> Yeah, it's just. Were there idea. were there some more points about uh, Renaissance philosophy? Mm. Um, that you I wanted just wanted to, to briefly read into the record here because I I, I wrote when <laughs> I I did some research about this a while back and I think it's really interesting. I'll just sort of skim this. So um, I, I arranged a bunch of philosophers by birth order. I think um, uh, Descartes was actually um, fifteen ninety six is when he was born. Yeah, he should be between Hobbes and uh, yeah. between Hobbes and Locke. I yeah, think. I didn't put Descartes in this list, but um, just because I wanted to see like the evolution of subjectivism during the Renaissance. So Hobbes thought that um, humans were selfish at an essential level, which is an interesting idea. It needed absolute monarchies to control their self-destructive tendencies, and uh -huh. then. Uh, Locke asserted that all people were created equal and independent, and everyone had a natural right to, to natural right to defend their life, health, liberty, or possessions. Which ended up, uh, he died in 1704. That ended up in our Constitution or, or the Declaration of Independence. I yes, think. Declaration. Yeah. Fifty mm -hmm. years later or so, um, and so that's where we got our modern conceptions. This is way pre Freud, of course, before identity. Um, he had the first theory in the Western world of mental conditioning, which was really interesting. Um, and which is the basis of the subjective subjectivistic view. He said, quote, each of us has our own take on reality because of individual experience and conditioning. So who can say what is true? That was a very, I mean, you can imagine being the Catholic church during that <laughs> yes. being like, whoa, right. this is not good. Right. Uh, and then Kant taught that there was an objective reality that, it, so it still existed, but the mind's subjective distortion of experience renders it unknowable. And that's a really key point there that yes, a lot of people unknowable. Argue. Yeah. Right, so if it's unknowable, right. well, then what do you do about it? Do you desire to know it or do you just give up and go with your subjective uh, take mm -hmm. on things? Uh, and then um, Kierkegaard, his subjectivity, subjectivity is truth and truth is subjectivity. So he accepts uh, objective facts, but argues that it's more valuable to investigate one's relationships to facts because this is the genesis of behavior. And that's another yes. really key turning point. In a, key turning point, yeah. Um, yep. And then Nietzsche really took that off to the races. And then <laughs> you could say he, he, the, the Enneagram 8, I'm sure that he was, was just like, that's it. There's no objective order. There's no objective structure. Subjective perspective is the greatest source of power. We can do whatever we want. And that's what a Superman does. And yeah, then, exactly. you know, 50 years later, Hitler was like, I love that idea. Let's craft a race exactly how we want it to be. And of yeah, course, I, go ahead. I, sw I swear Nietzsche and, um, and uh, uh, Wagner uh, uh, were both eights um, because oh, yeah, and for sure. the, the music of Wagner absolutely ca captures the Superman, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And there, there's and, another great example of, you know, the obvious Nietzsche and um, uh, even though I think Wagner did was, uh, I can't remember if they were contemporaries at all, but I think Wagner was not pleased about uh, the Nazis loving his music. He um, wasn't. That's right. Yeah. But the, but the Nazis were like, I mean, just like we were talking about the collapse of the the, the Catholic Church, the paradigmatic bases of of Nazism, uh, the the eugenics and the race cleansing stuff, and that was going on in the states too in different ways, where they're sterilizing mentally um, disabled people and stuff. That was going on in the states. And uh, did you know Asperger's, the 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 guy who discovered autism, was a Nazi? I know that. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, like. And they were helping the kids that they could and killing the rest. Yes. Like that was what was going on Defectives. with autism. Yeah. Defectives. Right. Yeah. So, but just to see like the judgment of these kinds of people are good and these other kinds of people are defective and must uh, not be allowed to reproduce. That's sort of a weird subjectivism as obje objectivism thing too. You philosophically know. that's right yeah. yeah it's not like well we're all people we're all god's children so i guess we all have our place in society it's no 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 we have an opinion about how people should be 
and that's and we're going to go with that. But um, you know, you so you could argue like that's the extreme subjectivism could have ended in 1945, you know, but yes. it, it went on from there. No, you would think, and and so that's exact. All that is all adds up to um, a horrible uh, dilemma because. But let's let's take let's let's add identities to that. Can we can mm -hmm. we do that uh, for the moment? Mm -hmm. um, identity would say um, all that talk about subjectivity and um, objectivity is based in I think therefore I am. Mm -hmm. When you cast I feel therefore I am or we feel therefore we are, a whole other um, reality to consider comes up, and that is that. Let's let's go. Res, uh, identity would agree that um, that there is an objective reality and a subjective take on it. Um, was that Kant who said that? I think so. Uh, yeah. Kant and yeah. Um, and so it would agree with Kant on that um, that uh, there's only and ever a subjective um, uh, a take on objective reality, making objective reality in many ways unknowable. So identity says good one and that whole thing is a thought is based on I think therefore I am identity steps in and says you know what objective reality is infinitely unknowable in one way mm -hmm. but that a healed emotional body will be able to get a far larger percentage of knowability about objective reality than mere thought and Freud so it's really, probably would have agreed with that. He wouldn't have used exactly those words, but that was what the idea was, right? Well, he still would have cast that, I would offer, he would have casted that as idiosyncratic, not essential. Yeah. In other words, yeah. and, but I, we're, we're going one step further. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. saying that it's existentially, take this on as an offering and see how it fits for your world, that when you heal the two-thirds of wound-based unconscious that you have, which requires you to take stock that there is an unconscious in the first place, informing all of your opinions and or distorting all of your opinions. Once that heals, a healed um, emotional body will heal the downline will willful body, will heal the down, will outwork and unfold a healed mental body and then a physical body because the essential has been cleansed of its um, uh, existential uh, issues. And in that sense, on the universe, the objective reality of divine being, which we cannot know in its absolute truth version of it, we get a much more, much more access to much more acreage of objective reality than imparted by an I think, therefore I am based, or I have a brain, therefore I am. So that I think, therefore I am not only repeated the, uh, uh, the absolutism, it literally limits its, our, its own positions is limited by the algorithm that created the positions. I think therefore I am will have a certain take on reality. I feel therefore I am um, will have a much more expansive one that includes intuitive reality, not just measurable reality by machines and the mind. So identity really is a watershed in the philosophical domain because it says we feel therefore we are goes directly and addresses this whole thing between subjectivity and objectivity by saying uh, you'll have more access, subjective access to objective reality if you feel first uh, and, and from a healed emotive body, not just have a passing mood and feeling about it. And so until that gets out into the world for a few hundred years, we're not going to have self-validating Proofs of that in, in the population, which is all it offers. Take this on and see where it takes you. Um, but if you go through EBE's process, you will self-validate that you'll get more take, more subjective take. It's forever subjective, but it will get cleaner, less distorted, and more expansive take on objective reality. And this is self-validated if you'll just have curiosity that we're emotional beings before we're energetic beings, before we're, we're willful beings, before we're mental beings, and before we're physical beings. So I, identity offers itself as a watershed philosophical moment in time 
that is not in resistance to either the mystical that was should have been replaced by the um, empirical but wasn't, it says both have their truths. Yeah. It's a metathesis. Yeah. Those that are two antithes antitheses. We go meta meta to it and say, no, no, there's truths in both of them and test them out. Here's how identity says you can test them out for yourself. Not believe it because Stace Barron or, or Joseph Shapiro say so, or even identity, whatever that is, which doesn't have a head or a mouth, except uh, those of us who are constantly investigating it. Still, <laughs> still, uh, after 40 years, I'm, I, I have doubt space about identity. And damn if it just keeps proving itself to me. And I look for all the unconscious reasons where it's, where it's Dido. You there know? are days where I hate that it's right about things. And Yeah, me too. Because it's, because eventually it shows up on our own doorsteps in the, of our personal lives, our mm -hmm. personal reality. And I hate so I, I, I hate as much what what identity has forced me to confront in myself as uh, as I do how much I celebrate it. And that's a real hard truth. Sure, that's a real yeah. hard truth. Well, it's like that the, the <clears throat> Matrix metaphor, you know, Neo is free of the Matrix and he's got tattered clothes and has to eat cream of wheat for breakfast every day, lunch. And yeah, day. It's, um, exactly. There, and yet there's this uh, immense power that he can, he can have as well. It's It goes cuts both ways. Yeah. So um, today was a bit philosophical, uh, and that's good um, because we I want to make sure on this podcast that there is there is as much um, contribution to classical philosophy uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that identity offers, not just uh, a fairly uh, counterintuitive way of looking at psychology, uh, counterintuitive way of looking at um, uh, Eastern spirituality and Western spirituality. Uh, it literally is a philosophical milestone. The first one ever based on we feel, therefore we are, and not passing moods and feeling, not feeling indulgence, but true emotive, um, healed emotive reality. Yeah, it, it leads me to a curiosity I've always had about um, philosophers in general, but certainly these Renaissance philosophers, be, be, because philosophy came out of mathematics, right? That's how it sort of started. Well, the the Greeks um, were kind of building on that. Um, yeah. Yeah, there was a link, but I, my, well, intuitively I feel it, but I don't remember. Yeah, the, I the question I have it. is, um, it's sort of a, a conclusion and process. The question I have is like, these guys, Nietzsche and, and Kant and Locke and these people, did they attempt to live according to what they thought about reality? Like how sincere and like, were they really testing their beliefs out? Or was it all just like making a coherent argument for how things are? Because, you know, when we talk about testing identity, like it's really yeah. like a moment to moment practice yes. and right. like like a spirituality, like like Buddhists right. were and, and um, esoteric right. Christianity and, and you know, uh, Islam, you know, you're praying five times a day. There's a practice to it. But with philosophy, it seems far more um, mental and segmented off and like. I mean, you know, I studied philosophy in college and there was a lot of people arguing about the nature of reality and representing different philosophers. But I don't remember people trying to actually live it, you know, like yeah. let's no. test Kant's view of reality. How would we do that by behaving in what ways and, you know, trying things out? And no, it's, it, 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 you're exactly right. It segments off because it lives in a thought based universe. Yeah. Right. right. So, of course, it's not it, it didn't have any. Here's what you do with. Um, our philosophical principles here. Here's the what they are. I mean, look at look at Freud. Freud, both Freud and um, and Jung believed um, unconscious wounding uh, in the in the unconscious of the subconscious uh, drove uh, most of our um, our behaviors uh, by default. And yet, um, Freud uh, took enough cocaine to kill a horse. He didn't have any curiosity about translating his paradigm. Uh, into uh, his addiction to cocaine, uh, which is um, fairly um, obvious. He wrote right? a lot. I don't recall him. And I read almost all of what Freud uh, um, wrote in college. I took this one class. and I don't remember him saying anything about how he was applying it to himself. <laughs> <laughs> well, the same thing with Jung, who is actually way more enlightened philosophically sure. than Freud is, in my opinion. But um, he was so enlightened and, uh, and, and so uncurious that he brought home one of his female patients and demanded his wife to accept her as his second wife. 
um, with no curiosity whatsoever um, uh, whether or not that could be toxic coming from his own unhealed wounding. So that's a, I use those not because I'm trying to make fun of them, but that there's no one, including me and including you, who um, who can ever be above not questioning our own belief systems. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, look at these two giants, um, yeah. uh, Freud and Jung. Uh, I don't agree with everything uh, uh, Freud said, but I agree with almost everything that Jung said about everyone in the dream being you, everyone, all people in the dream are you. And, and his work uh, on was, archetypes is seminal, for sure. Oh, unbelievable. And he was interested in the non-dual. I mean, this guy was had facets all over the place, but he yeah. brings home a female patient that he's sleeping with uh, to be his second wife and forces his wife to accept it. Now, there, he would be disbarred from any a, APA uh, um, certification, American Psychology Association, their psychiatric association, uh, for doing that. Yet he was one of the fathers of psychology, maybe mm -hmm. the uh, st older statesman, even though he well, was I remember younger. this was, uh, you know, it was during the 18th century, uh, mm -hmm. right? 1776? Yeah, uh, the, the 18th century that uh, of um, America, the United States, these were the slave owners who wanted to be free. I mean, if yes. they're, they're, as George Carlin <laughs> pointed out, like, is there a greater contradiction? Like the 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 capacity for mendacity is is not yet. Uh, we've not reached the limit of that. So, um, if 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 people only ever taught what they completely embodied, then we would have we would still be in the Stone Age, I guess. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there has so, to be a yeah. gap. And that's the other thing identity comes in to to address addresses that exactly also that until you embody embody what you psychologically philosophically and spiritually hold you're a dilettante you're not a connoisseur of the field and you've got less qualification which is why embodiment 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 is the is um, over and over uh, uh, emphasized in in identity and I, I couldn't, in the beta version, I couldn't embody identity at the time. I couldn't embody it. That was the problem. And that was the whole problem. And so I had to go to jail for seven years, uh, the jail of anonymity, mm -hmm. uh, while I had no opportunity to bring uh, identity out into the world um, because I had to make sure, or divine being in this case had to make sure that I didn't have any traces of toxicity from my own uh, wounding that um, collapsed the paradigm in 2015, the, mm -hmm. for the beta version anyway, which thank God it collapsed because now <laughs> both myself and uh, identity can move forward having said, okay, that beta, that beta test um, taught us something huge in its failure, right? Yeah. Taught us something huge. And the bottom line, and this was Brie all the way, if it's not embodied, it ain't so. If it's not embodied, it doesn't apply. If it's not embodied, it's pie in the sky, which is why your forte of rubber meets the road is so beautifully uh, articulates identity's whole philosophical foundation. But the and, and I just want to revise uh, just so that people don't hear it um, inaccurately. You did embody all it depends on where you look you didn't not embody the paradigm at all <laughs> not, no not, not all there mm -hmm. were just some ways in which you didn't but that leads us to this other question of like how much embodiment is required for it's like <laughs> i was just thinking this is like because i see it in in my clients what they can get and what they can not get and of course to be a responsible human being i have to look at okay well what is it that i'm not yet embodying how are they a reflection of me and it's like, for fuck's sake, like how much heat do we need to start a fire while the, we watch the world, um, you know, slowly um, flooding like a, like a pulmonary edema. It's choking on its own fluids, stagnating in its own morass of, of um, you know, distorted critical thinking and indulgence of feelings and, um, you know, arguing about facts. It just seems like every month it gets a little worse. And well, there is a benchmark. There, there is a benchmark algorithm for that. Mm -hmm. How do you know when you don't need heat anymore? Uh, uh, using your metaphor, there's there's a benchmark. How uh, do you know when you very, don't need heat anymore? You said uh, how much more heat can we take? You said uh, you just said. Oh, it's like minute. how much more heat does there need to be to start a fire? Exactly right. Uh -huh. Sorry. The answer is when you only have 
three core emotives embodied in your being, joy, sorrow, and compassion. Uh -huh. If you have other than 80% of your time, let's say two thirds, let's be generous with ourselves. We're all just idiots trying to get along here. <laughs> if two thirds of your consciousness is suffused with only joy, sorrow, and compassion, you have embodied identity. That's what's called Atma Brahmesh or uh, um, enlivenment, um, and we used to call it enheartenment. Um, so to the degree any of us, our day isn't more based in joy, sorrow, and compassion, and we're triggerable into all these other states, we've still got more heat to add before a fire of embodiment is, is achieved. So I can tell you at 71, Joseph, I'm just getting around to the first taste of that. I would say I'm at, I mean, Brie would say this also, 50 to 60% of the time I'm in joy, sorrow, or compassion. And, and um, the other 40% of the time is a way watered down version of any excesses. So hell, I'm just trying to get my, uh, my own uh, heart and soul wrapped around what identity teaches and I'm just barely qualifying. But that's important. There's the benchmark. Mm -hmm. There are three spiritually sober emotive states, core emotives, we call them, joy, sorrow, and compassion. And uh, I just got some really bad news today about um, um, uh, people talking trash about me behind my back and not, not have, again, not having the courage to confront me. And I was so surprised and, and gratified that all I could feel for this person was um, sorrow and compassion for the grave they were digging for themselves, not because they were criticizing me, but because their own, that's fine, I can take criticism, but that they are that they talk behind and, and don't have the courage to say, hey, this didn't work for me, why did you say that? Or I got this feeling here that that, uh, when they don't do that, they just dig a hole for themselves, not against me, I'm, I'm forever imperfect, but um, to talk trash behind my back is... Um, Wow, it uh, doesn't even, Bree said, doesn't that hurt? And, and I actually said, no, it doesn't really hurt. It's, it's more just, I hurt for this person. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't go all the way in um, to hurt me because all I could, I know this person very well and all I could feel is sorrow and compassion for yeah. why they're doing that. So that, the only reason I bring yeah. that up is a real, a real life moment here where I saw that I was coming from um, sorrow and compassion, whereas Daniel would have, would have been, wrote off a, a huge uh, immediate uh, angry email mm -hmm. and uh, kicked the person out of uh, his life. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what Daniel did. Um, and that yeah. is just... I, I, it's funny you said that I just I got an email this morning that was a review of a training I did for like eight people or so who were largely disengaged didn't do the assignments i gave them it was it, it, it the training i thought went pretty well i did my job but they didn't mm -hmm. do their job and they told yeah, their yeah. bosses that they uh you know they collected those thoughts and even though the, the the my clients the owners of the business have enough meta to see that their employees were not engaged i got angry but for yeah. me so that's not obviously a soul um uh, uh it's not joy sorrow or compassion but for me right now it was actually really useful and that was positive um uh -huh. uh, i didn't feel rage and uh -huh. i didn't yes feel, that yes. was different i didn't yes. feel rage which would have compelled me to want to you know uh, <laughs> yes. give them some new holes in their bodies and like <laughs> who's, which one of them should i email now or telling the clients that they didn't hold right, them accountable right, enough right. or whatever um, and I was able to sort of feel that and be with my uh, anger part and, and feel the aliveness related to that. And if that kind of thing happens enough times and then anger yes. heals, then I would imagine yes. I would have joy, sorrow, compassion as a you probably the latter two. As a, sure. As a so, yeah, and we should uh, uh, we'll just make a note for future here. The huge difference in identity between anger and rage. <laughs> and this is all Brie. Brie brought this to the table. I never yeah. thought of the difference this way. This is all her. That anger is is one of the most soulful and healthy emotions. It's the spine of our right to exist. And so rage is only a wound-based version of anger, but anger is one level um, uh, less um, uh, essential than yeah. joy, sorrow, and compassion. Yeah. But so without I've the ability, yeah. Succeeded in moving from rage yes. and resentment to yes. anger. And, yes. Yeah. And then it's on its way, then. Yeah.
Anger is self-healing. Um, it's just astounding what Brie has brought to the paradigm here. Oh, yeah, she who was so underestimated uh, by so many people for so many years. For sure. And yeah. I would also add is because when I do, and I've been, life has been so, life loves me so much. God loves me so much. It's giving me a lot to get angry about recently. <laughs> yes. Because now here, listen, did you hear what Joseph just said? Yeah. Take that in if you're listening, how important that is, what he really, just said. Really, it's like, I, and I'll notice it because it's like my, um, my sort of default wound state is um, depression. That's sort of where I came from. Uh, depression and overly mentalizing things. And then I did a lot of Zen stuff and I took on too much transcendence in there. So mm -hmm. I, my default sort of uh, lazy green place is uh, sort of a um, over, -intel over intellectualized, depressed, mm, kind of even keel. And, but when I, now that I'm starting to get access to real anger, like something will trigger that. And as long mm -hmm. as I don't go into rage with it, it's like, I feel the anger. It's not, comfortable right. but boy right. do i feel alive and then yes. i can start to feel joy because yes. that's yes. what's underneath it exactly right exactly we completely and this is all brief re-bracket the whole idea of anger into a positive and soulful reality that without which you can't get to joy sorrow and compassion because you don't have a right to exist um yeah. a bit beforehand which was it's which is in one of the key distinctions we'll get to this eventually but you don't direct anger at people so like no, when i was no. talking to my uh solar guy on the phone and he's like yeah that that uh, probably you need a 50 or a 60 amp breaker there instead of a 30 i heard my anger part saying then why the fuck did you put a 30 in there but i didn't yes. say that to him <laughs> correct yes <laughs> Yes, rage would say it, but uh, there's a difference between Joseph and his anger um, uh, subpersona in that way. Yeah. And that's exactly exactly the rubber meets the road example. Thanks. That's a beautiful example of it, is that you don't fuse anymore to your resented state. Yeah. Um, you just don't fuse. But if you don't give it the right to exist, yeah. not to transact, this is a key part of relationality, mm -hmm. not to let rage, but allow anger to um to develop in deconstructing control most of the time but not always yeah, that's um, a part of it. uh and so th in that sense we completely redefine and thanks thanks that uh, thanks for brie for that because that changed that repivoted my whole growth arc uh because uh, up until that point i was pathology I, I threw my anger in with my rage that had to be unplugged and i had to unplug my rage to get to the anger and that's what came up and then to have mm -hmm. that blessed uh, by by uh, Bree's teachings uh, was really really helpful. Yeah, and so, you mentioned control. I didn't characterize myself well enough there. It's the the anger is in me is rising up. Um, mm -hmm. Control is losing control of of mm -hmm. healthy anger, and so the anger is starting to show up. And I can listen to it. And so while all that anger was coming to me, I could listen to what anger wanted to tell me, so that I sure. could relate in a um, you know in a kind compassionate way to the guy who. <laughs> Um, exactly. Who I really like, and you know, it's like it would have yeah. been nice if he thought that through, but it did work, work for a while yeah. without tripping. So, <laughs> sure. So let's remind everyone that the, these podcasts are conversations, right? Mm -hmm. There is certainly a Joseph interviews me to expound on and support um, identity, and uh, every seems like every podcast. He has an aha, like, oh, you know, this was helpful to get just that one little small moment there today, for, for example. Sure. And so, but it's still a conversation. So this is not, uh, um, we, we don't, we didn't make this as only a teaching module. It's also about an embodiment um, module that um, we expose our own uh, difficulties and challenges in, per in, our, in our personal world and how identity affects it. Without that uh, openness and conversation ability about it, it, is, it ceases to become a lecture and becomes more of an interactive, humanized um, dynamic. And that's exactly what, what Joseph's idea was in starting this whole series. So. It was? Okay, well, cool. I it don't was. remember that. But yeah, <laughs> if you want to be part of the conversation, you can email me. You can find me at my website, clearandopen.com. So I just got an email. I just got an email today from someone. I totally forgot about that. And... Um, what was it about? Yeah, uh, let me pull that up here because it was interesting. It's going to, um, I'm just going to summarize 
Uh, they said, each time I hear Stace address epochs long gone, like Lumeria, Atlantis, the time of Yeshua, I feel a joy that is yet different to the one I experience anyway. Well, this, I don't think, uh, this is a German person, so they're talking in their second language, which is uh-huh. way better than I can do. Uh, while listening to you both, uh, I never had a grandpa telling me about the old times extensively, connecting me to generations prior, uh, the kingdoms, the grand task, glory, and misery. I sense a longing to be connected to the greater meaning and would love to you to do some love for you to do some episodes every once in a while on the bigger picture historically, You're talking about previous ep- epics. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, which I, I haven't heard you talk much about that kind of stuff, but that would be an interesting yes, thing to do. Absolutely. Um, uh, Moo Atlantis um, and Lumeria. Um, uh, uh, Moo is Lumeria. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Oh, Moo, yeah, right. uh, um, we're in the third ages. Moo and, and um, Atlanta, Atlantean ages prior, we're in the third age. Uh-huh. Uh, but those two um, in the past, we can uh, Akashicize uh, that one a bit, uh, maybe. And uh, but yeah, identity has some uh, interesting discourse about uh, what went on in Mu. What was the who were the soul species involved? What happened in the Atlantean age? Not just that included the whole myth of Atlantis, which wasn't only half a myth. Um, uh, different soul species was involved at that. Um, so we can talk about um, Mu and. Um, and Atlantis. And he also uh, wrote it put in the time of Yeshua. And it would be interesting to do like have the context of that be sort of an evolution of consciousness thing, because uh, it, mm-hmm. um, you know, it seems to be like, uh, what's that line? Um, I forget who said it, something like people doubt that a small group of people can change the world. But actually, it's always a small group of people. That's always how it works. <laughs> Um, you know, the founders yeah. of democracy, the Greek philosophers, um, you know, the formation yes. of Islam or Christianity or anything like that. There seems to be these sort of um, bottleneck points where there's a reformation, Gandhi, you know, where things yes. like that change. And, sure. And um, generally our our history and the stories we learn about that are, are usually at best broad brushes, if not outright distorted. So, yes. Um, interesting and that's the... Down. Beautifully said. That's the W H holon seeping down through the small h h o l o n holon, which is the individual small groups. Uh, same principle here. So mm-hmm. all real change happens when a lone uh, a lone group of people uh, uh, come up with a new paradigm that redefines all the values. Uh, that was in the previous paradigm or paradigms that preceded them. Mm-hmm. And uh, we have a new a piece of a new world. But because Catholicism uh, didn't uh, die when the uh, Protestant Reformation, when Martin Luther showed what kind of cojones he had, uh, mm-hmm. nailing that, that thing to the, the door there, uh, we're not identity has no um, delusion about uh, being a, uh, making a worldwide impact in my lifetime or maybe even yours. Um, we're looking for a couple of hundred years in advance uh, from now where maybe the fi- prior mystical and neo-mystical paradigms and empirical paradigms finally are exposed for their limitations and how they're now, now inhibiting consciousness in this age. Both the mystical and the empirical paradigms are now obstructive to human evolution. Identity offers for that for consideration. Mm. So... Well, this feels like a good place to complete. We ha- you had in the beginning three things we want to talk about today. We yeah, we'll have one. to do the other two. We'll have to do the other two, um, okay. which which clogs up relational space. The three main clogs in relational space. The one is I create my own reality. Oh, okay, that, that's the first one. Okay, and okay, we'll talk about the other two. We'll start that the other two next time. All right. Thank you All so right. much, Stace. I love this topic. I love this doing this podcast. Oh, we could. <laughs> I'm sure the listeners could hear your enthusiasm about this. It was beautiful. Well, the, just Passion. so they know, this aliveness was brought to you by connection to anger. That's the, <laughs> oh, dealing wonderful. with. I, I woke up sleepy. This is usually my day off, and I have, was thrust into dealing with. Uh, my batteries were too low. I was about to run out of power. My generator was not working. And getting pissed that I had to be the one to solve the problem is what made me feel alive today. So that's just sometimes how it works. That's how that's the magic of identity. Oh, let, let me one. I promise one Please. last thing. And that is 
um, the the true spiritual the true the true embodiment of a spiritual philosophy of life that you're trying to live pivots on a very simple phrase that life doesn't happen to us it happens for us mm -hmm. that there is a divine context for the human theater um, and that uh, everything that we see as as disasters almost everything not always but mostly um, ones that don't aren't life life and limb threatening um, are there for our uh, benefit to work through some issue because divine being whole on w h o l o n wants us as whole as possible to be downline transmitters and transmuters of its um, capacities so that its capacities can come to bear all the way down at this most dense universe so. amen yep and okay thank you yeah life is is helping me out these days and uh most of the time i'm able to see it that way <laughs> thank you stace thank you listeners tune in next time we'll get to the second thing possibly the third probably only the <laughs> second though <laughs> the clog up human relationality yes. yeah. yeah thank you bye for all now. right bye bye Thanks for listening to the Heart of Soul podcast. To learn more about Stace Barron and Identity, please visit identity.org. To learn more about Joseph Shapiro, visit clearandopen.com. Until next time, we wish you well on your journey.